y'all have heard or not that he is in the hospital. Uh, they took him, I don't know if it was last night or this morning. What the hospital? I'm, I'm assuming it's southeast in Dublin. That's where he always goes. Mr. Dale didn't really tell me, but I also didn't ask because I talked to Noah and he said, I think it's where he said it was. Um, all right, so yesterday evening, uh, they had to take Brother Doug. He had a tightening in his shoulder and down his side. Um, so they're running tests. I'm pretty sure from what Noah said, it was not a heart attack. But they don't know what it is. Um, they're still trying, even right, right now, they're still trying to figure it out and trying to find out what to do. So Noah said he's probably going to go over there tomorrow, get Miss Doris, bring her home so she can, you know, get changed, get a shower, get her car, get back up there with him. So y'all just be in prayer for uh, Brother Doug. Um, he's kind of had some, some issues in the past, so hopefully everything will be okay. So, anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, Vanessa, she got a phone call today, and um, we don't know anything yet, but yeah, just, just keep her in prayers. Okay. Will and do. today, he's doing really good. Praise the Lord. Awesome. Little Miss Memphis. Um, uh, not, I guess this is a praise report and a prayer request, I guess. Um, <clears throat> Sunday evening, we had, uh, I think about six guys show up and we went to visit some folks in the Uh, we got everything behind the church and down there to the road up until the, how many? 23 houses visited. Um, we had a lot of people who didn't answer the doors. Uh, but I, like I told them, next time guys, let's just don't wear you know white shirts and ties and black pants, okay? Nah, we didn't do that. We didn't wear that. I'm just kidding. That was a joke. That was a joke. So I'm glad y'all could laugh. Um, no, but we, we we did get some responses. I know that 23 houses got an invitation to our church uh, to the uh, revival coming up, and they got a gospel track. So whether they answer the door or not, they got some paper left on their porch. Whether they want to read it or charge us for delivering, that's up to them. But 23 houses did get to have a track with the gospel on it. So praise the Lord for that. Maybe that God will use that. And we plan to maybe go out again next month and maybe hit 23 more houses. So uh, we want to invite them in. If y'all want to come and be a part of that, we'd love to have y'all come and, and be with us. The more people we have, the more area we can cover. We divided up in teams of three uh, last time. So... I guess it was like six and a half million. Yeah. Because Joe was here. So. He was the best guy. Yep. <laughs> so, there you go. Um, anybody, anything else? All right. I'm going to do something a little different tonight. Brother Johnny, I'm going to ask you to open this tonight, if you don't mind, man. Okay. Go for it, man. Very gracious, Heavenly Father. Thank you for this, this time. Thank you. Thank you for everything, Lord. But thank you most for this opportunity to come and gather in your house and learn about your word, Lord, and I just let you go every year and every morning. That's the law Brother Stephen's going to present to us today, and uh, Lord, just be with you, each and every one of us. Let it be uh, delighting to you, Lord, in everything we, we do and everything we have, and we offer you all the praise in the precious name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, last we left off was Revelation chapter 5, and I think we finished uh, verse 4, so we are going into verse 5. I think we read through verse 8, right? Yes. That's what I thought. Um, but we will go back and we will check out verse 5. There's, there's some stuff, but all in all, I'm thinking we should finish chapter 5 tonight because I'm super excited to get started on chapter 6. It is pretty cool. Not that chapter 5 is not cool, but chapter 6 is cool as well. So verse 5, and it says... When I find it in my Bible, I'll tell you. Oh, but one of the 24 elders said to me, Stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to the throne of David, has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. Let me back up real quick and ask you why uh, did one of the elders come up to him and say, Stop weeping? Why, why was John crying? Because he thought that Satan was still going to prevail. He did. He, remember we left off in, chat, in verse 4, they didn't know who was going to open the scroll. And we talked a little bit about how John was kind of upset that he got to see all this, that he was promised all this when Jesus told him in the beginning, write down what you see, 
what was, what is, and what will come. And he thought for a brief moment in time he wasn't going to get to see this come to completion. Um, so he was crying because of that. But then one of the elders comes up, um, and the commentary I have here uh, kind of states uh, that it was significant that it was an elder and not an angel uh, that came to meet John's need at this point. Because we have to remember the elder we talked about earlier, the 24 elders that were around the throne, um, it was represented a redeemed and a raptured saint. So it was one of the saints, one of the redeemed, that came up and uh, basically ministered to him. Okay? Um, because like John, um, he understood the intensity of this concern better than any angel could. Okay? Because who redeemed the saints? Christ. Christ. So who redeemed the angels? We're not. Nobody, because they didn't need it. <laughs> so uh, they, the ones that were there are not fallen angels, which even the fallen ones are not getting redeemed because they made their choice. But since this was a saint, this was a redeemed saint, he understood where John was coming from. Now, we don't know who this particular representation or person might have been. Okay, the Bible does not say. Uh, but the fact that it was one of them, because he was in the same point, um, like he's in the same situation that John is. He's in need, in need of a redeemer, in need of a savior. Now, the only difference between the two, John just got up there. He's seeing all this for the first time. I guess we could assume from what we're reading, whoever or this saint or these saints are, they've been up there for a while. Okay, they've they've seen what it is that's, that's happening up there and what's going on. That's the the biggest kind, the biggest kind of difference between the two. And that would also make it like his peers, yes, or like us ministering <clears throat> to each other would be significant. Kind of, kind of, kind of. If you think about it, it kind of resembles what a church. Think about that for a second. I mean, what you got? Uh, I was going to say, like we were talking to you, 24 elders there, um, this is the baby, could it be the representative of the 12 apostles and 12 tribes? Here's the originating here. John is one of the 12 apostles. Could he be looking at himself? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there's there's been a lot of speculation as to who... Um, they could actually be or what they could actually represent. Uh, the Bible does not outright say. Um, there's a lot of people that are a lot smarter than me that have studied this for a lot longer than I have that have better opinions than I do. Okay? Well, even, and possibly, even, even if the, you know, when John was told to come up here and see things that are yet to come, that will be coming up after this event. <clears throat> well, this is definitely the future point. Then the 12 or the 24 sitting around the throne. <coughs> that would have been a futuristic, could have been a futuristic look into the heavens. Yeah, could have, could, definitely. Because at that time, would they, would they be in heaven already? That's what it's saying. But but they're sitting around the throne, so. If you see a future event, I'm just, I'm just speculating. Not yet. That, that's kind of, that's the beauty about this, is we can, we can definitely throw our, our thoughts and our speculations around, um, because, you know, the Bible doesn't outright say, but I, I will say this, um, and, I, and I, I don't know if I've ever used this example before, but I'm going to kind of tie it into this example. When I was taking classes with uh, Dr. Granger, uh, we got to talking about uh, the days of creation. Some people debate, I think we talked about this in our Sunday school class when we did Genesis, but some people talk about they were actual six 24-hour days. Some people say that they could have been years upon years upon thousands or whatever kind of years. And we got into a conversation that in a Bible class in college. And Dr. Granger basically said, this is, this is how he ended the conversation, after he let us sit there and talk about it for 15, 20 minutes. It doesn't matter. It's not important. What's important is you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. Who cares how long it took God to make everything? It's not important. One day you're either going to know or you're not going to care. Because it's, it, it's not going to be what's important. We just know that he did. Yes, sir. I had to say, my, my grandfather, he was a mission, Baptist missionary for about 60 years. And when I was about 11 years old, I had that same discussion with him. That was the same answer he gave me. There you go. That was back in 1973. I guess there's some, some relative to that. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is 
is whether these are representations of time or individual people or a um, group of people. It doesn't matter per se because in time, according to this, we're going to know because we're going to get to see it. And that's the last thing we're going to worry yeah. about. Like, like our focus is going to be solely on who's sitting that's on the right. throne. And then our focus is going to be solely on the lamb that's in front of them. So that's where our focus is going to be. And we'll, we'll know. I, I, I don't even know how we'll know, but we're going to know. I believe I understand. So. I believe the very time. And, uh, but that's, that's kind of the, the big thing there. It was an elder. And I, I really like what you said about the Peter thing. That kind of resonates with me. I don't know if anybody disagrees with that. But it kind of makes sense that a Peter would come. And I, I think it does kind of represent church because that's what we should be doing here. Uh, as we, we, don't, we, we come to church just to listen to a, a decent sermon or a good sermon or a bad sermon, whatever your preacher presents to you that Sunday. You know, cool. We come to church to, to, to sing. I wish we would do more than sing. I wish it would be more like worship and praise. Um, and, and, and we can do that. Uh, we, we come to church to, to fellowship with one another, to share a meal. Um, you know, these are all reasons we come. But as a church body, we have to build one another up. We have to encourage one another. We should not come to church and be discouraged. Like, no. That, we can get all the discouragement we want outside that door. I mean, I can walk out that door and get hit and knocked down by discouragement if I wanted to. You know, we, we should definitely, we, we come here to build each other up. That's just part of the church. That's part of what God called us to do. So, um, and I think that's very kind of representative of, of what is happening here. He, he ministers to him. He consoles him. So, that's pretty cool. Um, <coughs> One thing I want to talk about right here, uh, and I don't have it in the New Living Translation, but it is in the New King James Translation, and I'm going to read that point or right to you. It says, um, the very end of it, it says, The root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loosen the seven seals. That word prevailed right there is the um, same word used for overcome when Jesus was talking to the churches in the beginning of Revelation. <laughs> So I don't know if y'all, it's kind of cool because here we go, we have um, Jesus who has prevailed or who has overcome, he has the right to take the scroll and break the seals and open it, and it's the same overcome as Jesus said to the churches for those who believe will over, the overcomers basically, who will last to the end. So it's kind of a cool thing, kind of neat. So, alright. <clears throat> Verse 6 and maybe 7 at the same time. Uh -oh. oh, I know, right? And then I saw a lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered, but it was now standing between the throne and the four living beings and among the 24 elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes. There's that seven again, guys. And represent, which represent the sevenfold spirit of God that is sent out into every part of the earth. He stepped forward and took the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. And verse 8. When he took the scroll, the four living beings and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one having a heart, and they held gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And, and we'll stop there. Um, we'll get to verse 8 in just a minute. But talking about verse 6 first. <clears throat> um, okay. John was just crying. And we, we established that he was crying because he thought he was not going to get to see this thing to completion. He thought he was not going to get to see the one who was going to be able to open the scroll. When John looked up, I don't think he saw what he thought he was going to see. He expected to see Jesus. He expected to see Jesus as a lion. But instead, he saw Jesus as what? The lamb. The lamb. And I think that, that is very important because... What also is very cool about this is the lamb still looked like it had been slaughtered. He still bore the scars of what he did when he was on earth. But if you notice what the scriptures say, it had looked as if it had been slaughtered, but now was standing. Because now, when John didn't see the line that he anticipated, he saw the lamb standing in the midst of everything that was going on right there, okay? Uh, the commentator here 
he writes this about the lamb, the meekest of all God's animals, okay? All of his creation is the meekest one, okay? That's what he said. That's what this commentator said about the lamb. And instead of the lion, he, he saw that, okay? Um, okay, skipping down a little bit here. A note about the lamb as it stood, as it had been slain. And we talked about as it was standing because he was living, all right? We, we need to remember that. We, we serve a risen, living Savior, okay? That is the one, well, one of the main differences between us and every other religion in the world is every other religion in the world says, what can we do for God? Christianity is the only religion in the world that says, look what God did for you. Okay? That's, that's, that's Christianity right there. Yes, ma'am. And Jesus is continually offering himself, so isn't that why the lamb is still is being offered as a sacrifice? Very often, that makes, makes, makes good sense. I mean, it doesn't, I, I don't know where it would say that, but it makes sense. So, you want anything to add to that? If you have a comment, speak up, guys. Like, I, I want to hear your thoughts. I know Miss Bonnie has a lot of them. That she's still behaving. First time for everything. Yeah. <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> she didn't bring her to work. <laughs> Alright. So, talking about the seven horns and the seven eyes, we learned that represents the sevenfold Holy Spirit, okay? And we first realized that in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, and chapter 4, uh, verse 5. I'm not going to go into this whole thing, but there's also another reference um, in Zechariah, uh, chapter 4, verse 10. If you want to look that up, you can. Uh, there's kind of a, rep uh, a representation or a uh, reference uh, to that there. Um, but another thing here, and I did not know this. I want to share this with you. This is really cool. Um, what did we learn about number 7? Perfect. Perfect. Completion. That's right. The seven horns, okay? And um, Mr. John, you got your book with you? Oh, yeah. You on 101? Say again. 101? 101. Yep. Check this out. The seven horns may be the antitypical reference. Go to that paragraph. It's the yeah. third paragraph. Yeah. Reference to Joshua. Yep. Yeah. To Joshua, okay? Yeah. So I did not know this. Uh, when I was studying this, I seen this. I want to share this with you because it's kind of cool. Um, the name Joshua, uh, of course, is the same as Jesus, okay? Um, and when the children of Israel first entered into the land of Canaan to claim it for their own, um, as God had promised, they encountered a wicked city barring their way. So when in accord with God's command, the priests took seven trumpets of ram's horns, um, and the walls of Jericho tumbled down, and the city and its inhabitants were destroyed. So possibly... Uh, thus, these seven horns on the lamb may well have recalled to John the seven ram's horns of Joshua and their effectiveness in enabling the people of God to enter on their inheritance of the land that God promised. Um, thought that was really neat. I don't know if this is a thing, but this is an interpretation that this commentator thought was worth putting in here. So I wanted to share it with you guys. Um, and further, uh, their use as trumpets might have reminded John um, of the trumpet that he had used to call him to God's throne. I mean, what are we going to hear? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of, that's, that's kind of cool. I, I don't know. So, um, uh, something from Luke 1, verse 69. It says, uh, Thus the seven horns and the seven eyes of the heavenly lamb uh, would call to John's remembrance all the great promises of salvation both to Israel and to the whole world because Jesus himself is called the horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And that comes from um, Luke 1, verse 69. So kind of a reference uh, to that, possibly. Uh, anybody got anything to add to that? One thing I really like is how, and, and me and Kyle talk about this a whole bunch, and Kyle will bring stuff I've never even noticed to my attention. But how the old, the New Testament will always call back to the Old Testament. The Old Testament will always call back. I don't know how the Old Testament calls back to the New Testament, but it does. But like, it's like it goes hand in hand together. You can't have one without the other. And it's, it's almost like, and you can't say that, 
Well, they did that on purpose. Well, no, because they were written hundreds, if not thousands of years before this was done. And it's almost like they're they're verifying and, and validating what was written. When think about uh, Joshua, um, there is a phonetical difference in the uh, meaning between Joshua and Jesus. Joshua would be Joshua, Jesus would be Yeshua, and then you have Yeshua, which is Isaiah. And each one has a similar thing. The Joshua, the name for Joshua means the Lord will save. Jesus is Lord of salvation. And Isaiah, which I find it comical, is the prophecies he, he wrote, is the Lord will save. It is a prophecy of what's coming. And look at all the prophecies he wrote about Christ. Yep. So it's pretty cool. Yes, sir. <clears throat> that, that one part I think you can skip over the body of purpose. But uh, the, uh, the thing about the eyes, I, it kind of reached out on me. The, the seven eyes from back to uh, Zachariah mm -hmm. or uh, Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. <laughs> Zerubbabel. Yeah, he's in charge of rebuilding the temple after Babylon was built in. And, and um, it, it, it was a small thing to tell him to be restored on top of the whole earth. Seven eyes seeing the whole earth as the Lord sees and reminded people of it, as they did John as a great future day. Then there's also a contemporary colleague of his that was named, also named Joshua. And I forgot about that. But there was also another Joshua there, I can even die of priests at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, God gave him a symbol. Anybody else got any thoughts? I love to hear thoughts. Somewhere that the seven horns represented omnipotence and the seven eyes omniscience. Oh, really? Which are eyes suggest knowledge and wisdom, and horns suggest power. I'm thinking of that. Yep, you know, the horns used for a weapon. Yep. I mean, it. Anybody else? Love to hear thoughts. If you, don't, if you have a question, ask away. If you're not sure on something, not looking dragon. Yeah, the other guys, yes. you're here. <laughs> you're amongst friends. Like, ain't nobody here know everything. Okay. I, as a matter of fact, I probably know less than half of y'all, most of y'all, if not all of y'all. Okay. Um, I just happen to be the guy that that God called, and they agreed to let me be here. Um, so there's no such thing as a stupid question, and if we can't find the answer, we will look it up. We will find it, okay? Um, that's the cool thing about doing Bible study. There is somebody here that can research something and find the an answer to a question. So if you don't understand something or you have a question, please don't, don't be afraid to ask. Uh, we will, we will definitely figure it out together. So anybody else? All right. Verse seven. We read that already. All right. So, and when he took the, um, he came and took the book out of his right hand, uh, to whom it sat on the throne. Uh, the only really kind of the thing that I kind of did for this one right here that I kind of took out was this first paragraph here. Um, the moment that John had been waiting for, basically, had finally happened, okay? Uh, it was here. The lamb came and he took the title book, and the one who was on the throne gave it to him. Okay? I don't know if anybody gets the or understands the significance of that. Okay, because remember what we just talked about, I think it was last week, where they looked around for someone to be able to open it? Well, not only did they find someone to take it, God gave it to him, solidifying the deal. From his right hand. From his right hand, yes. Which is even cooler. Okay? So he came and he took the book and the God gave it to him. Basically acknowledging before the universe that the slain yet living Lamb of God was the world's redeemer. 
mentions him. I was good. I was good. Go through it today, but I did not have time. I got thinking, you know, why is that? And I was going to Google some more research, but I didn't have time today. About it, you know. Cool. <laughs> There you go. Let me know what he says. I'm kind of curious. He'll tell you. Yeah. Let, let me know what he says. He's always. Huh? Let me know what he says. Okay. Yeah, I want to know what he says. So. He'll go into all the details. I guarantee Yeah, I want you to take notes. I want to hear about them. I remember not. Yeah, I want to hear about them. All right. Uh, verse 8. And when um, he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four, uh, 24 elders, the, I'm sorry, the four and 20 elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them a harp and golden vials of odors or incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So, I need thoughts on that verse. Because when I was studying this, something came to my mind. So I need thoughts. Okay, the prayers of the saints on the odors is still held in the tradition of Judaism today. The, they take and write out the prayers and they'll burn the prayers along with the offering. So, they do that today? They, they oh, have wow. a golden wall. The, they, you, everybody knows the golden wall, the west wall. Mm -hmm. um, they'll put their prayers in the wall. Every, if you look at it, if you look in between the stones, you'll see pieces of paper. Every pass of the pool, all the prayers out of that. They still do it today. Anybody else? Are you talking about the wall in Israel? Yes. yes. I prayed there. <laughs> <laughs> I and my to daughter left a, a prayer in mm -hmm. those stones. That's cool. Any other thoughts on, on that verse? It, to me, it is kind of like the elders were um, recognizing Christ and Lamb as the, the Savior, you know, like giving recognition or authority or when they bowed down and worshiped Him because at first they were singing to the one who sat on the throne. So after this, when they found out He was worthy to open the seals, took the, seal, the scroll from God's hand, they began to worship and change and praise them and order it signified as it did. So, this is kind of a, a literal approach, and, and I'm probably reaching for this one. So, what do y'all think when it talks about how there are golden bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people? Are these prayers that have every prayer that's been sent up? Is it every prayer that hasn't been answered? <coughs> is it a mixture of both? Okay, here's why, here's why I say that. Uh, in the commentary here, uh, he, he writes this in the second paragraph. He said, uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Where do we know that from? Lord's prayer. Lord's prayer. I'm pretty sure every believer has probably prayed that prayer at least once in their life. Okay? And maybe if we haven't prayed that prayer particularly, we have taken things out of that. Um, because when we pray, we do a couple of things. We pray, uh, one, in Jesus' name, and two, in accordance to his will. Okay? It, it, would, would God have to answer a prayer if we pray from a perspective of our will? That's not, that's not what Jesus said. As a matter of fact, uh, Jesus said this in John 14, 14. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Okay? So, if, and I, I'm taking that. Now, yes, we might be stupid and say, Jesus, in your name, I want a new car. Okay, are we going to get that new car? That'd be probably not. So, more than likely, no. Now, is it within God's power to give us set heart? Yes. Um, but 
Jesus said, because he promised, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Um, and the believing prayers of godly saints will all be answered, though many will not see the answers before the Lord returns. So now we're sitting here with a bowl of prayers, okay? And I'm going to use this as an example. This is kind of what hit me when I was reading this and studying this. Um, how many times have we prayed for healing? I mean, every one of us has probably prayed for healing. How many times did God not heal that person? How many times did that person end up, or how many incidences did we see where that person we were praying for actually succumbed uh, to the illness they had, the disease they had, and they died? Thank you. If they were a born-again believer in Jesus Christ saved by grace, I promise you when they drew their last breath and closed their eyes, they were healed. We didn't see their healing. On this side of eternity. But they got it right there. So my thought in this whole thing. Was that's God. Answering our prayers. Either on this side of eternity. Or the next. Because if you're a born again believer in Jesus Christ. Saved by grace. You will be restored. Now I'm fixing to blow your mind even further. Did you know that not only. Christians and. well, okay, I don't want to use the name Christian. Okay, I want to use a born again believer in Jesus Christ. Saved by grace. Okay. They are going to get a new body one day. Did you also know that non-believers are going to get one too? Did God not answer that prayer for healing? They're restored in a new body. But unfortunately that new body, if they didn't believe, is meant to withstand the torments of heaven. So they continue. So that's, I, I find it, you know, yes, we may not see God answer things the way that, that we want them to be answered because in our own little finite minds, we think we know the best, okay? And especially if you're a guy, and especially if you're a lady. We all think we know the, what's the best, but I'm going to share something with you. We don't have a clue. We don't have a clue. Um, because if it were God's will for me to die so 1,000 people could come to Christ, let me go. Let me go. But then I, I might have 2,000 people praying for my healing and restoration on this earth, not knowing what God's plan is. You see where I'm going with this? So I don't know if I'm on, if this even makes any sense, but that's, that's kind of what stuck out to me when I read that. God will answer the prayers because... He himself promised, if we ask in his name, he'll answer. They may just not be the way that we like them to be. They may not be the way we want them to be. And we may not see them in this life. And the back of what you're saying, you get the middle of the heaven and say, it's according to God's will. It's, that's the thing, when God answers prayers, it's going to be according to his will, and he's going to be glorified. No one else is going to the glory but him. Think back through your life. How messed up would we be if God had answered every prayer we lifted up? <laughs> <laughs> I'd probably be dead. <laughs> I want to take all that out because some of our prayers would have changed the path, the course of where we would be today. Mm -hmm. And, it would, and that would not be in God's will, because God's will is for you. The people are here today, sitting in this room, God willed it for them to be here, to hear the message Brother Steve has given. So I, sometimes I, I try to remind myself that although I'm not much of a Carl Brooks fan. <laughs> really? Yeah. So I have my own reasons. Me and Alan just don't belong. You and Garth don't see that out. Me and Alan can't. Song to come out, you know, there was a lot of wisdom in that song to me. Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered uh -huh. prayers. And, Amen. And, and I had to sit around and think about all the stupid things in my mind, you know, as growing up, as 
was just a, a little take I had on, on that verse when I, when I read that. And, and then you kind of you pair up what the Bible says with what the Bible says. And you just kind of... So. Anybody anything want to add to that? So, uh, verse 9, and they sang a new song with these words, you are worthy to take the scroll and to break its seals and open it, for you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. All right. Um, so, so kind of here, think about this for a second. When, when they started singing this, can you imagine the what it must sound like? What it's going to sound like? Not must have. I mean, must have for John, but must of going to for us. Uh, because I don't think that not only the 24 elders were singing here. I think there were billions. Um, the Bible actually talks about uh, innumerable. We talked about that uh, at the beginning. We talked about the angels and stuff. Actually, we talked about that during the angel study. I'm sorry. Um, how there were so many people. And, and the cool thing about it is, and how we kind of figure that out, is uh, talking about the end of the verse, how has redeemed us to God um, from every tribe, language, and people and nation. Now, if you go out through history, and even today, there's a lot of tribes, there's a lot of languages, and there's a lot of people, and there's a lot of nations. So there's a lot of folks sitting there praising God. So, kind of kind of cool to think about. Um, verse, anybody have anything to add to verse 9? Sing. Yes, ma'am. You know that song, The Goodness of God? I think I do. <laughs> Can you sing it? Have you ever just listened to the words to it? I, think I, I, have. It. I, I don't want to say I have it, but I have it. I think I have it. All right, verse 10. Hey, I've got, I've got, yes, sir. Is that that last paragraph in there? It's just the thing that's sitting right where the author said about the noteworthy. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you know, we need to look at it. Oh, the I thought of that too. About singing about blood and, you know, and not being embarrassed about that because many of the modern day congregations are trying to take that out of music yep. that they sing. Mm -hmm. Yep.